Welcome. Uh, this is the story matters. It and all stories matter. Your story matters. So we thank you for taking time to to watch. And the story that will the stories will be shared by our guests will also deeply matter. And stories become the essence of kind of who we are and what our life is all about. So we're very pleased uh, today to have Steve Jewett and. Um, he is going to share with us, and I'm going to kind of go back in history <laughs> and remember when the two of us met. It was yeah. about 16 years ago, yeah. and at that time you were the pastor of the Baptist Church. Yep, Memorial Baptist, yeah. And, and you were also on the school board. That's right. And shortly after that you became president of the school board. That's right, yeah. And, and you always were involved with uh, young people. Mm -hmm. and. So maybe just could begin to st reflect upon stories as related to young people in your life. Well, that's uh, that's interesting. You mentioned that uh, that when we met, and it was right after Columbine happened, and we the um, it seemed so important to be able to uh, validate and um, do anything we could possibly do. To make sure that young people knew they were valued and empowered, and I've always been a strong believer in the fact that uh, the way we best honor and inspire youth is to uh, give them responsibility, and that's what we were mm -hmm. involved with in the time is is uh, working with with a really an incredible group of young people. I just ran into uh, one of them the other day, uh, and. Uh, 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 challenge them to uh, do and to organize uh, things that would be significant in the lives of, of those people. Um, but you're right, story is something which is valuable to youth, but it's not kid stuff at all. I think that story is something which, which forms us, forms, um, forms uh, attitudes and, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, habits that uh, that uh, can serve us well the rest of our lives. And uh, the reason I mention habits is uh, it reminds me of my sister, uh, my older sister, who when I was a little kid, uh, four years old, um, three years old, and in there, she would uh, sit with me in the bathroom and put me up on the counter and brush my teeth. Mm. And when she was brushing my teeth, uh, she would always tell a story, and I got a chance to say, "Okay, who you know? Who are the characters today?" And it was usually Tom and Al, and usually Al was the was the good guy, and and, and whoever was the bad guy, we'll say Tom in this case. And it was always a story of Al um, brushing his teeth and going to the dentist and not having any problems with them and all of this sort of stuff. And of course you know yeah. what happened to Tom and not brushing his teeth and his teeth falling out and all manner of horrible things happening to him. So uh, that was something that caused me to keep brushing my teeth. <laughs> <laughs> that in a, in a real nasty lecture I got in St. John's Barry. Uh, I, hadn't, I hadn't been to a dentist throughout my college years and grad school years because you kind of couldn't afford it. but. Mm -hmm. When we got to St. Johnsbury, um, I'd never had a cavity in my life, and so I went breezing into a dental exam and found out I had 21. And uh, what this dentist did was they was uh, she they uh, had you go meet with the dentist's wife, which was you would rather have a root canal <laughs> than go through that because she just uh, this is how you brush your teeth. And just you know, had all of these horrid pictures, and it was—it definitely was not Al and Tom. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, you felt you know, I, I was in my late twenties, and I felt as though I was was uh, six or mm -hmm. or had been taken to the woodshed. But I, you know, sometimes adverse stimuli works, and boy, I just didn't want to ever go through a lecture like that again. And uh, I pr improved my technique in exactly the way the the uh, dentist's wife, who should remain and will remain nameless, uh, uh, suggested, and well, anyway, it, it's formative. It's, it's formative stuff. And uh, from 
from the from the Tom and Al days, I was despairing about how when I was in Pasumsing, Vermont, which is three miles south of St. Jay, was wondering, well, you know, how do I really get people to understand what I'm trying to say in a sermon? And sermons are usually propositional, as you well know. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, uh, for some reason, this flashback came to me of Tom and Al and my sister sitting there brushing my teeth. And so I always start, I, I, I started to move uh, the, main the main point I was going to try to make in the sermon into the children's time and turned it into a story. And, and imagine, imagination just sort of takes over when you, when you have a proposition, when, when you're going to give a message that hopefully means something. Mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty easy to translate it into a story. Mm -hmm. At least, uh, I, I think that's generally true once you let your imagination start to work. And so, you know, every once in a while, at, you know, on the door on the way out, somebody would say, you know, I always get more out of your stories than your sermons. And that was fine with me. <laughs> that was just fine with me. Was, and there were a couple of people who figured me out. Yeah. Yeah. So, so story has been a, literally a part of your life all the way through from the beginning, because uh, there's nothing more basic than brushing your teeth, I think. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that's true, but you know, it's an easy thing to forget, too. Uh, there are times when, when uh, being aware of all of life as a story uh, can get caught up in the busyness and the details, and other mm -hmm. times when, you know, when you're too busy studying for a final exam mm -hmm. to uh, think about a story, then it's sort of a sad situation. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, all my you know at different times in my life, and uh, and now in retirement, uh, it's starting to take on a, a different form of life. Actually, what is it like in retirement? Uh, it's I'm finding that the stories become a little bit more, well, a lot more autobiographical. And one of the things I learned uh, in going to a storytelling festival was uh, that. Uh, the melding of stories together uh, with personal experience. Uh, you don't have to always be chronologically correct because the truth of a story isn't necessarily in the details but in the narrative itself. Mm -hmm. And so um, who knows that when I was t telling a story at Christmas time in South Africa uh, that uh, the house that I was describing uh, between uh, uh, Brandon and Pittsburgh on Route 7 uh, uh, didn't have a kerosene stove. Uh, mm -hmm. The kerosene stove was in the story to give the sense of, of um, somebody who uh, wasn't particularly wealthy and I wanted to capture um, the it, to, a, to a South African audience that might be more uh, uh, familiar with kerosene, uh, kerosene equipment, what, you know, what the, the scene in this home was. And I, mit I mixed actually two or three different things from my background. A painting that uh, I picked up as a kid in a kid in Massachusetts, and uh, uh, the house that I used to drive by going to Manchester Center, mm -hmm. and wa and I've been driving by it for years and years and years, and it just seemed to, as oftentimes happens, unfortunately, you see a place just deteriorate mm -hmm. and deteriorate, and then one day it's gone. You know, the state, had, the highway department had torn it down, but every time I went by that place, I started, I, I sort of imagined, what would Christmas be like in that mm -hmm. place? Mm -hmm. what, you know, how many, how many uh, parties were held there, and what, what sort of people were, were involved, or who lived there? So I put a story together mm -hmm. based on this painting of an old man holding a boat, uh, that house, and a guy named Charlie Bagley, who um, lived in Pasumsic and was the uh, was the uh, overseer of the Barnett Town dump, but he was also um, Santa Claus on uh, a radio show in St. Johnsbury, mm. and it was he was always a stitch because he had the greatest uh, Northeast Kingdom accent. You know, you know, and you, you listen to him on the radio, and, and you didn't had no idea it was Charlie Bagley. It was Santa Claus mm. until I really listened closely and. The kids would be giving off their list of all the things they wanted for Christmas, and go, ah, out, out, you want a trunk, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. And finally, when he'd had enough, he'd say, "Now, 
now you'll just take whatever old Sandy will give you now, won't you? <laughs> and so uh, that was a that got into the story too, because Charlie was the last person to live in that house, and uh, Charlie became a uh, an old uh, became the son of a of a, of a sailor mm -hmm. uh, who had given him this boat, and he ends up at Helen Porter <clears throat> rehab and. Uh, gives the boat away mm -hmm. um, to uh, to a child mm. on uh, on Christmas Eve, so that's again just different biographical experience, which gives you the color and the authenticity to the story. It comes together to take on a life of its own. You've made a lot of connections, of ordinary things that often could get missed. Absolutely, right? yeah, and. And, and that's both true locally, and, and but you've had a lot of experience outside in different parts of the world, right? Yep. And could you talk a little bit about that and well, and how the story plays out there? Um, yeah, yeah. When you and I uh, got together, when we first met, I was going to Romania mm -hmm. every year and uh, every summer for to do an English camp for a couple of weeks, and. Um, the uh, camp was for kids from the city of Timisoara who had come out by train to this little village uh, where we where we were located, and that village has really stuck in my memory and the lives of the people in the village, as much as we got to know them, became important. And there was an orphanage there that went back from the communist days uh, under Shashescu who. Uh, that was set up in where uh, where the baronial manor used to be, and it was just across the street from where we were. Uh, and so stories became important, uh, you know, around the campfire. Oftentimes, it was a story that really connected with mm -hmm. with people. And uh, again, uh, yeah, Patrice Romania has become <laughs> important in a in a, uh, a small novel I've written that's. I'm still working on. The one thing I'm discovering is that narration, um, oral narration and writing are um, two different disciplines. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, writing is much more demanding. Mm -hmm. But I've, got, I've been getting some good counsel on, on how to put that together. But It's coming? It's coming. It's, oh, yeah. It's, it's, been, it's done, yeah. but I'm just now in draft four. Okay. And okay. the village in, in the story, in, in, which is a quest, is is actually the village in Romania mm -hmm. is the one where the, the information came from. The, the sound of walking down a, uh, uh, a lane, uh, hearing the hard, the hard uh, sand and gravel mixing, mm -hmm. uh, sounding under your feet. Uh, that's, as a conversation's going on, that comes straight out of that experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, um, in, in terms of, uh, these experiences, with, uh, you t took young people uh, as a part of that. <laughs> that's right. Process, yeah, right? yeah, that's right. So uh, both young people in Middlebury and connecting to Boston and young people connecting yeah. to, uh, t to a wider world. That's true. Uh, actually, uh, one of the things, getting back to the idea that giving, uh, giving young people um, important responsibility and mm -hmm. reflecting on that. What I think what uh, we as older, older, more experienced adults bring us experience. And so uh, on, those, on those trips, we would have maybe 12 people, uh, three or four of whom would be adults, maybe four, maybe five at the most, and six or seven that were youth, most, sometimes from, most of the time from Memorial Baptist, but also mm -hmm. from other churches within Baptist churches in Vermont and New Hampshire, sometimes beyond. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, learning to respect each other as a team, um, learning a lot about conflict resolution, mm -hmm. and a lot about communication when you're when you're five thousand miles away from home. <laughs> you're not going to yeah. uh, learning learning a different culture. And you did that for how many years? Uh, I did that seven years. Uh, that's quite a few young people. There was quite a few young people, and uh, every once in a while, I hear from some of the ones in Romania. I mean, mm -hmm. one, one of them's a lawyer. One of them's a lawyer now. A couple of them are doctors, and mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, every once in a while, and actually, one of the village girls let me know that her grandmother, who was our cook, passed away, uh, and 
yeah, it's mm -hmm. Facebook has added that dimension. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, Facebook, you do do quite a bit of work on on digital. Uh, I, I not a whole lot. It goes, it go, it comes. I and go it less. Goes. I can tell you. I, that. I'm going less. Yeah. I have to tell you that too. Uh, it's just, uh, it's sometimes it's a fire hose of. Mm -hmm. superficial mm -hmm. super, superficialities and it's mm -hmm. just good to get into a conversation yeah get into some back and forth but it, it's it, but on the positive side I reconnected with a lot of my high school classmates mm -hmm. I mean a lot some of whom as as our lives have gone on we actually are a lot more similar than we were in high school mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, share a lot of the same um, attitudes and sometimes contrasting attitudes that uh, act like iron sharpening iron. <laughs> Does it replace um, reunions? And no, it actually enhances, enhances reu reunions. It, it, it enhances reunions in this case. I would have never gone to a, a class reunion 850 miles away. Mm -hmm. If it hadn't been for um, the beginning of reconnecting there and I went back to one reunion the 45th and realized that I think Tom Wolf may have been a little off when he said you can't come home. Mm -hmm. uh, that was coming home. Now, a, you know, a lot of that thesis still holds a lot of water, but um, to be with people who, you know, like the, the, the fat kid who, uh, who played football and we all, and people on the football team always really affirmed him and kept him going, who was, uh, mm -hmm. who would have been uh, in special education today, mm -hmm. certainly, who has been a successful farmer, mm -hmm. uh, has a, has a uh, wonderful wife and who could win a Joseph Stalin lookalike contest. I don't, <laughs> I mean, you know, he's got this beard, he just, <laughs> you never, I mean, just strange and wonderful combinations. I can, and, I can draw that picture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's still stocky, but, you know, just to see people. And one of the kids who was just on the background uh, um, actually dropped out but went back to school later. Mm -hmm. um, now a successful physicist. and. <laughs> It's kind of amazing, yeah. the, the, the changes that have taken oh, I, 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 place well, over that time. Because yeah. you get up to serious numbers when you get 45. You know. That's right. Well, yeah. Yeah. I, I, you, you may have some experience with that. But a little, little more. Uh, it's next year's 60 from college. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, I, can, I can go back and... Uh, Play that over in my mind, and uh, well, it's like um, for my first trip for a hunger study program to Bangladesh. I, I, I can, uh, if I sit there, uh, I can play that back in my mind, you know. And, and there's stories that are there. Oh, I'd love to hear. Yeah, because that's one place I've never been. But yeah. part of the mystique is to get to some place you've never been. The world's longest beach. 96 miles runs from Chittagong down to what used to be called Burma. Yeah. And it's continuous all the way, all the way along. Huh. And everybody does what we do, what we used to do uh, in Lake Michigan, go down at night, take shoes off, walk in the sand, uh, play on the waves. And I thought, uh, I'm, yeah. I'm, it's just it's just like home. It's the same. <laughs> it's kind of the same story. Yes. So yeah. many thousands of miles away. I'd forgotten we had that in common. I was a central Michigander, and you were on the coast. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So you're retired, but you were, when I met you in the store, <clears throat> and we talked about this, you were yeah. talking about. A project in particular that you uh, are involved with. So you want to talk about that? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, again, there's a story behind that. Uh, but I'm uh, pretty active in Charter House Coalition, especially mm -hmm. the uh, the homeless shelter that runs uh, during the winter time. Um, uh, you know, roughly from October to October 15th to April 15th. Mm -hmm. Uh, Charter House Coalition also has uh, um, make sure that there's a meal 
uh, for poor people every day in this town, uh, either um, at one uh, at Charter House itself, one at the Episcopal Church, the Friday night supper, which everybody should should you know go just to have a meal, but also to be you know be a part of mm -hmm. serving one of those things. It's just a lot of fun, mm -hmm. a lot of connection with people because uh, you're doing something in common. Uh, it's just a, a joyful time. Uh, but but most of the time I'm spending now is with. Um, with uh, being an intake coordinator at night uh, when people are coming in at Charter House and also uh, um, I'm also the uh, uh, on the board uh, on the board I'm in charge of uh, recruiting volunteers so if anybody wants to volunteer yeah. Glenn you'd be you'd be <coughs> terrific uh, come you know we are always looking for people and you need quite a few we right? need quite a few because one of the things that makes charter house unique is that because of our because of the people in the community who are willing to volunteer and there mm -hmm. are all sorts of different um, ways you can volunteer and some people think that well you know sitting around and reading a book uh, while nothing is going on isn't important but it is important mm -hmm. because because it's your being there and if that's all you, if that's all you have time and an ability, mm -hmm. ability you feel like to do that. Just that being there um, can be an important thing. Now there are a lot of other more involved things like meal preparation, mm -hmm. meal, mm -hmm. uh, you know, supervision, this sort of stuff. Uh, but there's some there's something just about anybody can do because but that just the ability to be there becomes an important part. And the story behind that comes is that when the 2008 crash happened. Um, the crisis looked so dark at that time because of the way the fuel prices were going at that time, as you remember, and mm -hmm. everything else, that it was one of the first times that both um, faith communities and uh, and private and state agencies got together and said, this is so big, what are we going to do together? Mm -hmm. And things actually happened together. And it was the most energizing, um, one of the most energizing uh, things that I ever was involved with. And, well, I went away for three and a half years to do an interim pastorate. I couldn't wait to get back, mm -hmm. and so now I am back. Mm -hmm. And um, and say so. a little bit more about uh, about how what the service is and how people participate mm -hmm. in the process. Because there may be folks who know the title Charter House and know transitional housing, but don't really know. What what that what it that right. entails, I guess. Okay, uh, let's let's look at the housing piece of it more particularly. You mentioned transitional housing, which is housing for people uh, who are um, getting back on their feet or getting on their feet for the first mm -hmm. time, who are uh, economically challenged and who um, need that need a break to get in, in into a, uh, an apartment for the first time, so that they can transition out into the. Um, into the uh, private market or into the into the more subsidized housing that's generally available in the community. Uh, so we we have one house that does that, and uh, but then uh, one of the things that came out of from the uh, 2008 crisis was homelessness. And you wouldn't think that there are people who are homeless in Addison County, but you know counts show that sometimes up to 210 people are. They might be couch diving. They may stay in cars. At this mm -hmm. time of the year, they're probably out in the woods tenting someplace. Um, if somebody becomes desperate, at that, uh, became desperate at that time, um, and it still happens on occasion, they're they're left to contact police, who then um, contact social agencies, and they go to a, uh, mm -hmm. a, a motel for the night. No meals. Mm -hmm. uh, Charterhouse gives a much more contact with social agencies that might be able to help people out. And in talking with residents, it also, uh, the one thing they like is that, it, is that the volunteers want to be there. And so because we have so many volunteers involved, the cost goes down. So where somebody who's homeless and goes to a motel costs $85 mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. state, uh, we can do that for about 15 Sixteen dollars, all because of donations. All because people in this community are willing to do whatever they can do um, to um, 
to help out. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can have as little or as much contact as possible, you know, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. But a huge help from college students. I can't tell you how many college students have gotten out of the bubble and have, mm -hmm. have gotten out into this community. And um, they're just wonderful people to get to know. So you get to know some of the finest people, uh, I think, in Addison County through mm -hmm. volunteering. I'm sure it's true with other organizations, but I'm certain that's true here. Mm -hmm. um, and just it's the side conversations you have. It's the the problem solving sometimes uh, uh, that that happens that mm -hmm. um, makes makes a difference. And you can always go on the char if you Googled Charter House Coalition, that would take you over to the website in a snap. All right, that'll tell people how to exactly make the contact. Right, and also you're going to be seeing more um, information on on um, volunteering. Mm -hmm. and one of the things I'm doing right now is because there are so many different kinds of jobs that are available, uh, I'm actually writing, I'll probably spend some time today writing job descriptions that mm -hmm. we'll put on the website mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that people can look at that and say, hmm, I can do that. Do, do I understand that when it, overnight there's two people on as volunteers? Uh, well, we have some paid staff, and they are usually the people who are overnight, but sometimes we have a volunteer as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have people in the evening who uh, help serve meals and who, again, just are a presence on the, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the, the overnight shelter is for sing people who are single. That's on the first floor. The second floor has um, bedrooms available for families. And mm -hmm. so there are children, uh, you know, parents single or, or married or unmarried parents with children who are there mm -hmm. on, the, on the second floor. And a meal is brought up to them, and so we have volunteers doing that. But one of the things is that we usually like to have three people on and make sure that we have at least one opposite gender mm -hmm. person. So if there are two female paid staff on, I might stay overnight or, mm -hmm. or Frank Mazza or, or Doug Sinclair mm -hmm. as volunteers just so that we have some balance there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes you can sleep, and uh, some, but there's always a way, somebody awake on both mm -hmm. floors. Yeah. So I, I remember from talking with Tom Colley that uh, yeah. I, I seem to remember the figure 120 some volunteers that were needed or something. About that, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, to be honest, it, sometimes it's very, you know, things get thin, and mm -hmm. we could always use more. And yeah. we, and, uh, you know, at, at by the end of the season, uh, you're you're ready to take a take a break. Uh, but a, yes. it takes about a week before you really miss it. And the season is from it's roughly from October fifteenth until uh, April fifteenth. When it gets cold. When it gets cold. And yes. And stays cold. And stays cold. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And, and we were filled most of last uh, during that sure, season. Sure. Sure. Uh, you've had l this has been enjoyable because mm. you are very rich in your connections with, with people and with stories and uh, uh, I want to thank you for uh, coming and spending the time. And well, it's been One a last story you want, want to tell? We got uh, just about a minute. Oh, a story in a minute. Uh, there was a retired uh, uh, denominational executive who, uh, who moved to a small college town who ran into an overly earnest uh, uh, Baptist pastor who he had to figure out whether or not he was really okay since, since he was a Methodist. And uh, they began to work on a few things that, uh, that interested them both. And, uh, and uh, the two became friends in the process. Uh, one became, both became much more silver-haired um, one became more like Yoda, but the other one remained a kid all his life. Okay, thank you. That's a great <laughs> story. We, we really appreciate you being here, and uh, it's exciting, all the things that you're doing and the stories that you're, you, you have told and, and, uh, and, and the way you're committing your life, so thank you. Well, thank you for having me in. It's good to be together again. Okay. <laughs>